<clears throat> Good morning, Ms. Savoy. As I understand it, um, you and Mr. Tucker are dividing the argument, and you have seven and a half minutes each. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, Your Honors. If it may please the Court, I'm Catherine Savoy on behalf of Warren Jepson, and with me is my associate, Todd Tisdale. Mr. Jepson would like the Court to know at the outset that he is not against affordable housing. He lives across the street from two properties owned by the Ipswich Housing Authority, which comprise over 100 units of affordable housing. He also would like the court to know that he has no particular interest in torpedoing this project and that he has no interest in torpedoing the aspect of this project that is mixed-use development. Well, what is his uh, claim of standing? His claim of standing is, um, in this appeal, is twofold. First, it's that the um, drainage calculations that were submitted to the zoning board were inaccurate and Furthermore, that they Didn't led. He have some obligation not just to claim that they were inaccurate, but to show that they were inaccurate? Well, he did do that, um, Your Honor. Throughout the record, there are numerous instances where the chairman of the Conservation Commission um, and the conservation agent both uh, took site visits after the board issued its decision and observed um, increasing beaver dam activity and uh, noted that there was an increasing concern about flooding on Mr. Jepson's property. The other um, point, even um, apart from the beaver dam issue, which, which can be a little bit of a red herring, was a point that was raised by um, the uh, chairman of the, um, of the Conservation Commission, and it's in the record at 396-397. He explains the history of the Saltonstall Brook and the history of the site in relation to the Saltonstall Brook. And, and he says the Saltonstall Brook was long ago channeled <coughs> into the millstone site. This is the millstone site that we're talking about, the subject site. He said the site functions as a flood water storage area, which if eliminated without adequate compensatory measures, and he underlines without adequate compensatory measures, would result in higher water level in the brook at times of high runoff, leading to the further inundation of the Jepson property at 102 County Road. Throughout the record, there are numerous instances where the chairman of the Conservation Commission and the conservation agent and, and the private consultant that was hired by the ZBA to advise the ZBA um, as to this, this property, all three people have repeatedly stated in numerous um, excerpts that I've quoted in my, I've cited to in my reply brief, in addition to others that I did not cite in my reply brief at R100 and R239, not once but twice did the town's consultant express concern about the drainage and the potential for flooding the adjacent properties downstream of the site. Mr. Jensen's, uh, Jepson's property is downstream of the site. I didn't understand um, something. When were the, the beaver dams were created after the YMCA got its comprehensive permit? There is a, there's a question of yes. fact about that. There was some beaver activity. That, the record is not clear on when the beaver dams got there. That, that's part of my question. I don't know enough about beaver dams, but is there anything in the record that indicates do the dams change their place from time to time? Uh, yes, the yes, dams so, do change their place. Right, so what effect does that have? Well, it changes because of the significant beaver activity that was observed at the, at the juncture when the DEP took its site visit. Um, they, they observed that it was a lot worse, that the flooding on the site was a lot worse than it had been prior to the comprehensive permit, and they assumed, they inferred from that that the beaver activity had created a, a rised water level that therefore did not uh, render the data submitted to the ZBA to be accurate. But I'm saying even without the beaver dam concern, there's certainly enough evidence in this record of the concern expressed by the Chair, the very experienced and long-standing chairman of the Conservation Commission, the very experienced conservation agent, and the very experienced engineer. These people were not paid to give this opinion that they were concerned about the flooding on the Jepson site. This was not a paid opinion. This was an opinion that they gave in the course of, the of their duties. I think that ha it has a more powerful effect than a paid than if uh, Warren Jepson would have gone out and gotten a paid opinion on to this effect. I don't think he needed to, by the way, under Marashlia. Well, what Do you, um, other than the the storm water and this flood control, you assert other claims for standing as well? That's right? correct. The other Traffic. claim. 
trespassing? I think the, trust, the uh, pedestrian trespassing is the next strongest claim. And there is actually uh, also record support for that claim. Um, on page 102 in the record, there is a, a memo from the recreation director, Betty Dorman, who specifically expresses a concern about school children getting from the project to the, I, I hope <coughs> I'm saying this correctly, the Giles Furman Park. And the Giles Furman Park is on the other side of Mr. Jepson's property from the project. So you have the proposed uh, housing, then you have a, a small area of DPW owned property, then you have Mr. Jepson's property, then you have the park. And the problem that Mr. Jepson has experienced is, you know, I think I mentioned there's over 100 units of subsidized housing across the street from this site and from Mr. Jepson's property. The problem that he experiences is the children getting from their housing over to the Giles Furman Park and going over his land. He sees it, he observes it, he's the landowner, he's aware of it. I don't think he needs to hire an expert to tell the court that if 48 additional units of subsidized housing are constructed next door to his property, there will be additional children. In fact, I believe it's in the record um, that the Y had anticipated the number of additional children that will be uh, coming to, that will be living at the site. It's at least 50, and it, it, I think it might even go higher than that, but we don't even need that admission. Uh, it's cited, that is cited in my brief, by the way, but we don't need that, that admission. It goes, it's common sense that there will be additional children trespassing over Mr. Jepson's property. Can't he take steps about the trespassing? He certainly can, but we're talking about, in this case, he's, he, I'm sure he can't. Can't be the case. I mean, we, ha we allow schools just about everywhere, so the fact that they are children can't be a basis for st the children will trespass. Well, that's true that the children will trespass. The problem that we have... I mean, it's it true that the children will trespass. If children are told not to go to a particular area and, and there's some penalty for going there, why would children trespass? Well, I think if, you saw, if we saw the site, that we would understand that they kind of have to, to get to the park. <clears throat> this is a busy highway. This is one of the problems with, the si with this site. It's a is very- Is there no sidewalk in front of it? There property? is no sidewalk. The sidewalk proposed for the project ends at the Y, at the end of the Y property, at the DPW property. So there's no sidewalk that goes in front of Mr. Jepson's property. So you're saying there's no way to get from the proposed project to the park without going across his property? That's correct, unless you want to travel, unless you want to walk onto the highway. It's a very, very busy highway. And the, you know, the problem that Mr. Je Jepson has, quite frankly, is the construction of the, how, of, of the buildings being within five feet from the edge of the highway. That's not, that's not the, uh, that was the problem of the commercial properties. Right? That's correct. That is the that's commercial. That's not the housing. The housing and the commercial property are in the same, <coughs> are in the same building. It's, it's the floors above. That's, that's correct. correct. That's correct. But the, the children are going to have to come out the front door of that, of that building, and they're going to have to walk down the highway. It is the, one of the busiest uh, highways in the city, of, in the town of Ipswich. It's a very, it's a major corridor getting into the town, and they're going to have to walk down across Mr. Jepson's property as the children from across the street do to get to the park. How do the, the children from across the street cross the highway? It's, it's not a good situation, but they do, they do get across. They do, they do get across, and they do, and the kids from the Y also come down across this property. But I, I think increase, I think we're, we're talking about standing. He doesn't have to prove at the standing case um, the merits of his entire case. All he has to standing is a gateway into the court. Mr. Jepson has on this record amply demonstrated that his concerns are not unique to him, to, are not subjective concerns that only he holds. These are concerns held by other responsible, qualified individuals within the town government. Thank and you, thank you, Ms. Um, Savoy. Oh, may I just have one word, Your Honor, since we talked about standing on the... Excuse uh, me, Ms. Savoy, but unfortunately, if you split your time, you get seven and a half minutes, not eight and a half minutes, and you can, assure, you can rest assured that we will read your brief. Thank you. Mr. Tucker. May it please the court, Michael Tucker for the Ipswich Housing Authority, who uh, similarly has no, uh, uh, no prejudice against uh, uh, residential housing or affordable residential housing. Uh, we are here today on two issues, uh, both of which are briefed. Uh, the first is the standing of a municipal authority 
to uh, approach the court on an issue such as this. Uh, it, this appears to be an issue of first impression and, in fact, uh, was not an issue that was decided in the uh, Rule 56 uh, motion or memorandum of decision by Judge Kottmeyer. The uh, standing issue relates to the fact that, as an abutter, uh, with two parcels of property located directly adjacent to the uh, appellee's property or the proposed comprehensive permit, uh, they have a direct uh, and an important justiciable claim. So your position is that the fact that you're a municipal authority is irrelevant. The fact you're in a butter is what counts. Isn't that your position? That's, That's right. correct, Judge Cowan. The, the idea is that the 100 units of, uh, of uh, affordable housing that uh, my clients are essentially, uh, if, they were a, if they were a real estate trust and they were the trustees of the trust, they would have a fiduciary responsibility to address a comprehensive permit that came to uh, that came to abut two of their parcels of property, and uh, that's simply what they're trying to do today. Why are we measuring your standing under under 40B Section 21? I, my understanding, uh, Justice Cordy, is that the uh, 40B has been used as sort of a uh, an incantation that you can wave over a variety of uh, problems to fix uh, the commercial. Uh, aspect of this comprehensive permit is one of those. Uh, it's uh, 40, 40 A17, I think, uh, is the appropriate, uh, the appropriate standing issue with respect to uh, abutters. But I do think that because we're a municipal authority, uh, it has been, uh, it's been understood under standing in other uh, cases. It's also, that, the Hingham case talks about 40 B21. Yeah, it's that's what they say. Service. That's what, that's, that's yeah. what they say is uh, the, the basis of standing on a challenge to a comprehensive permit is 40 B21. And they specifically, I, I don't know how you get around the Hingham case. It says that a municipal authority doesn't, doesn't have standing under 40B21. But a municipal, a municipal authority that abuts the property is an, is an issue that has not been addressed by this court or any other in Massachusetts that I'm aware of. But is there of. anything in 40B about abutting the property? Well, it, it refers back to 40A17. 40A17, where all the abutters have uh, standing as an initial uh, matter to address all of the issues in the conference of permit. And as somebody who has 100 units of residential housing and has children who have to cross the highway to get to the park, uh, they certainly have a responsibility to the people that, uh, for whom they are less I thought Hingham went off on the notion that um, municipal authorities are not, quote, persons. Persons. Right. Well, persons. persons and aggrieved persons. So you're, if you're not a person, you can't be aggrieved. Well, uh, would a real estate trust be a person or would an LLC be a person uh, under this statute? Well, I don't know about that, but I, I know, know the Planning Board of Hingham case says that municipal authorities are not. Municipal persons. boards and officers are not persons for purposes of standing. And 40A17 says that as an initial matter, everyone who's an abutter has standing. Can, 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 can I, I just, switch a little? Just ask yes. you a question. If, assume you have standing, or that you, I mean, that you're not automatically out of the box because you're a municipal authority. The, this, the standing claim you make, as I take it, is traffic, right? That's correct. But all you've submitted is, is a letter from the, uh, I, I guess, the executive director of the Housing Authority, who attaches uh, and relies mostly on a letter from the DPW, which is not in a butter, right? That's correct. Um, which is pretty speculative stuff, isn't it? I mean, is that really enough to give you standing? Well, uh, I, think it, I think it certainly would be, at least at the Rule 56 stage. It raises an issue with respect no, to no, whether no, the no, traffic... No, 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 no. We have been, I think, fairly careful, which is what I was asking Ms. Savoy about, that you, you may have, assuming that you're not knocked out under 40 v. 21, that, that there's a threshold you'll in a butter, but then you have to come forward with something and to say that you have standing is whether you can even get to a Rule 56. And the question is... Of, you know, what do people come forward with? Well, it's the traffic issue. There's a, there's but a hundred. There's no, but I think ju the, the import of Justice Botsford's question yeah. is that, in fact, you haven't come forward with anything that would show that, they would, that this would have any impact on traffic, which could not be dealt with appropriately. It's not, every time you build a building, a single family, there is some more traffic. Ten houses, there is some more traffic. A residential development, there's more traffic. That's not the question, is there more traffic? The question is, is there going to be a proposal which will 
deal with this appropriately. And it seems to me that it, at least there's nothing here that suggests that this couldn't be handled appropriately. Or that it could. Uh, there's, there's nothing in the record. There, there is something in the record that indicates that the traffic is going to be increased as you, as. Well, increase is not sufficient. An, an increase directly across from 100 units of housing, uh, which contain low and moderate income uh, mothers and children, can be very significant. Yeah, but you have to tell me why. Uh, it the, can't just be one more car is going to be, or five more cars or ten more cars. That's not. It, well, uh, the, the, record, the record is what it is. There's an increase in the traffic, and, and it's our position, the Ipswich Housing Authority's position, that the increase in traffic is detrimental to the people that they're responsible for. Mr. Tucker, could I ask you to just go beyond the standing question to address the, um, the, the point that you raise about the fact that this proposed project includes, includes commercial uh, enterprises? Uh, certainly. It, it's not uh, a difficulty for the IHA that it includes a commercial enterprise. Uh, we understand that 40B can, uh, can be in a variety of zoning districts. It can have a variety of mixed-use uh, uh, sorts of uh, purposes. The problem is that in this case, 40B was used to circumvent the necessary commercial variances that would be required for things like turnaround area, for setbacks, uh, for a, a variety of, uh, of commercial. And, and there are ways of addressing all of those issues that don't require the waiving of 40B over a commercial uh, project. I think that uh, in Boothroyd and the cases that have come down uh, since 40B has been enacted, uh, it's, uh, 40B has become a cure-all for a number of uh, variance difficulties that <clears throat> developers have had. And so my concern would be that the commercial aspect of the project would be something that would be uh, would not be appropriately addressed, or would be uh, would be a source of concern for zoning boards in all of the cities and towns of Massachusetts. For people who who sit on those boards and they hear 40B and they think, well, I can't say anything about a inappropriately zoned commercial use. Uh, 40B allows the developer to make uh, commercially viable uh, a project that was intended under the statute for uh, simple residential low and moderate income housing. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Tucker. Good morning. Good morning. Mr. May Brown. it please the Court. Well, picking, Howard up, Brown. picking up on the last point, it would seem self-evident that if the commercial activity is a reasonable percentage or less of the whole housing complex, and here it's about 14 percent, I understand. Or, or even less, yes, Your Honor. Then it would seem that 40B would protect it. And that's the fact that com the commercial activity under 40B is, is able to obviate the necessity of, you know, getting what otherwise might be some difficult variances and some other things falls by the wayside. That's our position, Your Honor. Our, our, uh, with respect to the commercial mm -hmm. use issue, our position is that there's nothing, that, that the approach that's taken by the appellants in this case, a very restrictive and cramped approach to this statute, is completely contrary to the way this Court has approached Chapter 40B over the years, the decades that it's been there, which is, first of all, there's nothing in the statute that says you can't have a commercial use. So there's nothing in the, we look at the, start with the plain language, there's nothing there that says that, a, you know, a minimal commercial use is not possible. Next, you look at the intent. Wait, no, wait, 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 wait. So let's say we had um, 10 fabulous units and, you know, pick a number, 50-50. 50% commercial space, 50% all affordable housing. I mean, what are we supposed to do with that? Well, <clears throat> happily, we're not presented with that, Your Honor. No, I understand. And, and, and I mean, I don't, I, I, I'm I not going to have just this case, right? I'm going to have, I'm going to have developers looking at what we say about whether or not you can include um, you know, commercial, does it, you know, commercial property. So that's my first question is, tell me where my dividing line is. You're talking about minimal or de minimis. And the second is, does it make a difference if you're in a commercially zoned area? Well, I, I think it does. In, in we following, limit, if we, with respect if, to the second question, the Landers case from the appeals court tells us that, number one, it's okay to have a commercial use in a 40B project, and in particular where you're not purporting to, where it's in a, commercial, a place that's commercially zoned, and you're not purporting to change it from residential to commercial. 
So I, I believe that answers the second question. So but that's an easier one. So if you right. zone for commercial, I mean, there the, the still might be some residual concerns that even in a commercial, in an area that is zoned for commercial use, there, there are many such areas that have residential uses, and part of what you want to do is make sure that uh, whatever the whatever the zoning requirements are for commercial use, that those not be overridden. I, I'm sorry, I didn't follow. But it's, 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 it is a commercial property, and but I, I think that there's authority to override the commercial restrictions. Um, Your Honor, the, uh, I think one thing that is important to point out, and then I'll answer your first question, sure. if I may, is that the, it, it, it's something, and I have to confess, we didn't argue this in the brief. It didn't become clear to me until I really was studying the record and was speaking with my client about it. The commercial use was at the request of the town of Ipswich, and this is actually shown in the record of this case. I think it's important to note that this is not something the Y came along and sought to impose on an unwilling town. There is actually in the record, and it was the record before the zoning board, uh, a letter from the chairman of the planning board basically praising this project and saying, we're glad you've got a commercial use. We're glad that it's, you know, you're approaching the commercial corridor of the town and the appearance of this project will fit in, the commercial use will fit in. So it, it's in the record. And I can cite your honors to, to the, the exact pages if you like. You, you can submit a letter afterwards if you don't have it right at the tips of your Thank fingers. You. Mr. But, Brown, yes. um, d in, in, in this case, um, could the commercial uses um, have been have, have been f placed in somewhere else in the footprint of this overall project and conformed um, with the commercial zoning? And but for the fact that housing was thrown in, it would have uh, complied with zoning. I, I think, if, if I'm understanding your question correctly, the, if you look at this project, there's two plots of land that are separated, 108 and 112. And the, the commercial slash daycare is in 112, which is an L-shaped building. And the objection that the Apollons raise is simply that that building itself got setback relief. I think the bylaws say, I think, that the building's supposed to be, I forget, it was possibly 50 or 100 feet 50 from the road. And 20, 50, 50 and 20 on, 50 on right. one side, 20 right. on the other. And, and this is going to be very close to the road, also at the request and praised by the planning board in that same letter that I was alluding to. But to answer your question, I, what, what the Apollons are saying is the only way that we could build that building um, is if we complied, if we pushed it back 100 feet. I don't even know if it's possible to do that on, that, on the plot of land. But that's, that's what the Appalachians are contending. But, but, but if you had placed the commercial enterprises in, in, in uh, somewhere within the footprint of either of those two buildings, would, would it have complied with existing zoning? Well, I, I guess I don't understand. It is within the, we, it is within the footprint of the building. I mean, it's, it's within the there, I don't think there was any way, as long as this building was located five feet from the road, there was no place we could put that daycare center and the commercial use and still have complied. I, I take it you're saying you, you, you first get a waiver f under 40B for how close you can come to the road. Yes. Then when you, ha then when you if you have an L-shaped building, you can put the daycare center technically at the front of the building or technically at the back of the building, but that can't, that can't be the deciding factor. Right, because we, and they're saying we, we couldn't, put the building there at all. If, if we have a daycare center, we can't locate that building there. We've got to put it somewhere else. And do, do other states have st um, statutes similar to our 40B? I, I, I noticed in a, in a footnote to one of the cases, and I don't recall, an earlier case of this court, Connecticut and Rhode Island apparently are modeled after Massachusetts. They I'm not are. aware of any, uh, any case law. I was law wondering if anything had come up about this in another Going state. Going back to the um, commercial uh, use and the question that was asked. We obviously have got to say something about it in relation yes. to the whole 40B. Would it, and, and we, I don't think we can quantify it in percentages and say, well, you know, if you go over 50 percent of commercial use, it's, that's no good. Would such language as, um, as long as the project is predominantly devoted to housing, substantially devoted, it complies with the purpose of the statute, even though it has. Is that kind of language you think uh, adequate enough? Well, that would be my suggestion. It, because I answer, don't see any way to quantify it. To answer the Chief Justice's question, I would have said where the thrust of the project is clearly residential in nature, where the gravamen. So I, okay, I, I think well, that that's just, words, uh, it's just words. I mean, yeah, but it's can I, can those I, words are back and forth. Can I just can I go back to um, your because originally you said. The commercial aspect of the problem was included at the request 
Um, yes. And then you said there's several letters praising it. I, I have I have the sites for okay. for your honor. First, the um, at, a, at page 67 of the appendix, there's a letter from Jack Meany, the executive director of the YMCA. Now, this is a letter to DHCD, but in there he relates that it, the commercial use was included. He's applying for the DHCD right. approval. He relates that the commercial use was included at the request of the planning board. But the thing I'm, in, in addition to that, there is a letter from the planning and development department director, which is at page 108 of the appendix. And what he says is, the planning board, the selectmen, and I support the proposal to create affordable rental housing at this location along with the provision of commercial space. Um, and, and then he goes on to say, we're pleased the conceptual plan for Powderhouse Village locates the buildings close to County Road with car parking at the back of the sites. This configuration strengthens the County Road corridor, makes the project more welcoming of pedestrians, and hides the cars in paved areas associated with Powderhouse Village from view. So this is what the planning board wanted. They didn't want to have a, the first thing you see from the road be a parking lot. They wanted the parking in the back. Therefore, the building has to come to the front. No, we don't reach any of this if neither of these folks have standing. Which so, is our contention. And, and, yes, and, and do you want to explain briefly why they don't? You're going to say the Hingham case knocks the housing authority out of the picture? We, we agree that and it is our position that the Hingham case takes care of the housing authority. But What I about a housing authority who's in a butter? I, I, you know, I don't think that, that's a question I don't think this court has to deal with because I think if you focus in on what the actual factual under, underlaying of this case is, and you look at the summary judgment record, you'll see that these issues, the traffic issue, the beaver issue, um, the trespassing issue, there's really virtually nothing. It's an extremely thin, if not non-existent, summary judgment record. And I'd like, if I may, to point you to a couple of different things in particular. One is the, um, this trespassing issue. Um, if you actually look at Mr. Jepson's affidavit about trespassing, he doesn't even say in there that it's likely that there's going to be trespassing. He points. He says, "Well, you know, there are. You know, there's not going to be a sidewalk." And and uh, let's see, 543. One alternative for the school children is to trespass through my property. That's the extent of what he says. In other words, and he wants to use that to. This project, by the way, has been delayed for. The process started. We got the permit three years ago, and it's on the basis of what I consider to be really a baseless, a lack of standing. And it shows you what can happen in a situation like this. But that's the, so much for the trespassing issue. And by the way, there's a condition in this permit that requires that a fence be built between the uh, Powderhouse Village and the property. And that's at, at page A635, uh, condition number 18. Um, with respect to the, the traffic, another, you know, it's very similar. We ha have an expert, um, and our expert engineer opines, and it was in the summary judgment record before um, Judge Kottmeyer, that there was not going to be a detrimental effect from traffic. And in fact, I just want to say this about the trespassing. One of the conditions was that there be a traffic light, a self-actuated traffic light built so that what should happen is that kids should be able to go and press the button so pedestrians, it'll stop traffic, which there is no light there now. It's actually so our expert look at, that there be an improvement. What you're saying is if we look at Mr. Jepson's materials, submissions on the Rule 56, we'll just find a bunch of speculation. That's, that, that is that what you're finding. That knocks him out. Absolutely. And that's, I mean, that applies to the trespassing. And, and you never, I, in my view, you never have to get to the, the, the commercial issue. The, these uh, appellants do not have standing under this court's case law. And in particular, if you just take Standerwick, your court, this court's decision in Standerwick, and you look at the holdings and the rulings and the, and the logic of that case, and you apply it to this factual record, there is no standing for these appellants. Um, and, and, and the summary judgment submissions are, you know, extremely thin. The, um, so I started to say that the, our engineer said it's actually going to make it, we have an expert opinion saying it's going to make it safer. It's going to improve traffic safety. And he says that there's not going to be any degradation or, 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 or worsening of flooding. Now, that's what we put forward. We went through a nine-month process before the zoning board. We hired experts. The zoning board hired experts. The zoning board made a rational decision. You know, ultimately, um, the appellants would have to show that this decision was arbitrary, capricious. There's nothing. If you look at this record, there is nothing arbitrary or capricious about what the zoning board did. They went through a very deliberate, really a model of a process, and that's something else that our engineer, who's quite familiar with these processes, says in his affidavit. 
Um, Mr. Uh, Glan, is there anything in the record that suggests what the increased costs are going to be to this project because of the three-year period of delay? I, I don't think there is anything in the record to be, to be candid about it. But it's one of the, one of the things is that it jeopard, the continual delays jeopardize, can jeopardize funding. And I don't believe we've lost the funding in this case, otherwise we wouldn't be here. But it's, it's a problem. It, you, you have to, there are funding cycles that you have to meet, and, and the, it, it's, it's been it's, three years. It's, it's somewhat ironical that the statute hasn't been amended to put penalties on folks, and I'm not necessarily saying it's these folks, but folks who uh, bring claims to del that, that eventually have no merit that delay the project. Well, that, I mean, that, that is our view. And, and, uh, There's really, nothing in the statute that permits attorney's fees for you or anything like I, that? I think we'd have to show nothing in that statute. We'd have to, it would, and it would have to rise to the level of 231.6F, and, and, and we know we're not statute. making that contention. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Mr. Brown, can I ask you, but back to the question that the yes, Chief sir. Justice asked you about um, uh, the commercial use and the planning board asking for it. In the opinion, certainly of uh, Judge Kottmeyer's, uh, and I think she's quoting the underlying opinion. Right. There's, uh, she speaks of um, the fact that the commercial use is integrally related to the housing and sort of uh, is going to help fund it or you know support it. So, which is, seems sort of inconsistent with the plan, or, or is that why the planning board was asking for it? I, I'm, I'm just a little confused about that. I, I believe, and I, I don't know that this is in the record, but I believe the reason the planning board asked for it is this is on the way, it's like the gateway to the downtown of Ipswich where there's commercial use. They wanted the use of this property to be consistent. They didn't want purely housing. They wanted some commercial use. But I think, you know, Judge Kottmeyer's point was, and we haven't really focused on this, is the daycare center. You know, ac according to the appellants, the mere fact that there's going to be a daycare center in this affordable housing project makes it ineligible for um, relief under 40B. And, and there, if we talk about an integral relationship, and I think that's what they meant when they said integral relationship, but um, what could be more integral to a family housing project with multiple bedroom apartments than, than daycare? And, and, the, but, and yet, according to the appellants, we couldn't do that. Matter of fact, if we wanted to, we'd have to have built a separate daycare center, you know, 100 feet back from the road. Um, I, I would say one, one thing I would ask this court is there is a um, there are, are two excellent uh, amicus briefs that were filed. One by the Citizens Housing Planning Association, another that was filed with a motion for leave by the New England Legal Foundation, and and I that was filed only recently, and they had to seek leave. And I would urge the court to allow that motion and to accept that brief. It's an excellent brief, and it takes into account the court's recent decisions um, in the Middleborough case, et cetera. And, and I think you'll find it useful and, and helpful in making this decision. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Brown.